quick and do Sirion and Sky, which we'll be able to refer to each other. Um, I'm Heron, just to start. I'm Caroline. I'm Sean. Megan. John P. Uh, Jeff. And I'm Brian. And I'm also Lauren Starbo. <laughs> and in the corner here, uh, doing some homework, <laughs> is Sinjalu. Okay, so uh, we continue on with the, um, the Occupy Buffalo Justice Dialogue, and I want to uh, make a special note and give recognition and thanks to Canisius College. This is going to be the seventh philosophy professor from the Canisius Philosophy Department participating in the um, Justice Dialogue. We're very thankful for Canisius answering our call and, and taking really a, a lead. Um, I'm looking forward to having other institutions, um, well, it's not the institutions are donating their professors, it's the professors from the institutions coming forward to contribute. And we hope to uh, expand quite a bit in the new year, but I, I, I want to give recognition to Canisius' efforts and, and thank you as an individual in the department. So uh, I'll just read a little blurb about the Justice Dialogue and get into Sean's talk on libertarianism. So, we, the Occupy Buffalo movement, have come together to resist the injustice of the corporate domination of our political institutions. Um, towards the end of changing these institutions so they are more responsive to our needs, we invite citizens of various levels of education to contribute to and benefit from an ongoing public discourse on the broad subject of justice. We believe that the democratic process at the Occupy movement has adopted carries great moral authority and its openness to all voices, its orientation towards peaceful relations, and its commitment to a pragmatic uh, consensus. However, our democratic process stands in need of knowledge and a vision of our common uh, well-being. This justice dialogue is dedicated to sharing our collective knowledge and developing a shared vision of a better future for all of us. So I want to welcome Sean Donahue Johnson, um, who's going to speak on libertarianism, the smaller government equal greater liberty. Well, thanks a lot. Um, thanks a lot for having me. Thanks a lot, everybody, for being here as well. I'm really excited to uh, be able to uh, share my thoughts with you and also uh, contribute to this. So, um, the title of the paper is on libertarianism to smaller government equal greater liberty. Um, so, I'll just get started. Uh, in an interview on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart a few months ago, uh, Ron Paul, who is the Libertarian candidate for the Republican presidential nomination, responded to a question about whether or not he is an electable figure. He said, some people just flat out don't understand what freedom is all about. And they don't understand how the market works. And I think that's the main reason why they're intimidated by me having a presence on the stage. When I first started thinking about the topic of this talk earlier this month, Ron Paul was just starting to rise in the polls, and now he's projected to win the Iowa caucus. He has. He has won the yeah. Iowa caucus, yeah. sorry. I believe so. so. Wrote this before. Yes. Has he? Yeah. Good. Yeah. All right. Interesting. Well, so now they're talking to about this. who's second. <laughs> yeah. That's what the is focusing on, actually. <laughs> okay. Whether, uh, whether he'll um, win the nomination is, of course, another question. Uh, but either way, his current popularity provides us uh, with as good an occasion for, uh, as any for discussing the concept of liberty. So what does liberty or freedom mean for libertarians like Ron Paul? And what is it about the libertarian conception of liberty that is so intimidating? For some people anyway, what makes Ron Paul such an intim intimidating presence in the presidential race is not that they don't understand what his idea of freedom is about, but that they do. Uh, the libertarian conception of liberty is a very contentious and potentially dangerous idea, uh, and I think it's important for us to really understand what it's all about uh, in order to understand whether uh, we do find it intimidating, whether we do find it to be appealing, or what exactly we think about liberty. So, um, I'd like to take a look at several features of the libertarian uh, conception of liberty and what it would mean for us if we were to actually determine public policy. The first feature that I'd like to discuss is that libertarian liberty is understood in a purely negative sense. I am free insofar as others do not interfere with my actions. The only thing that others must do to respect my liberty is basically to do nothing. That is, they must refrain from uh, coercing or from harming me. They have no duty to actually do anything for me or to provide me with anything. 
And this goes for government as well. The government's job is to protect my individual liberty uh, by protecting me against others and nothing more. For if the government were to actually provide me with anything, including things that would appear to enhance my freedom, such as education, health care, or even roads, uh, it would be acting paternalistically. That is, it would be acting like a parent trying to take care of a child, and this is not what freedom is all about, according to Ron Paul. Uh, and libertarians, of course. As Ron Paul put it in one of uh, the Republican debates, freedom is about taking your own risks, even if that means dying from a treatable disease because you decided not to purchase health insurance. You have to accept the consequences of the choices that you make, and to have the government step in and help, in this case, would be to go back on those choices. Thus, libertarians advocate uh, not just small government, but minimal government. The state's functions are reduced to the functions of the night watchman, uh, which does nothing more than protect individuals from one another. For libertarians, then, government cannot tell us how to live our lives, even, if, even in cases where it would be for our own good. It cannot force me, for example, uh, to wear a seatbelt or a motorcycle helmet, nor can it tell me not to drink alcohol or do drugs. Ron Paul's position on the legalization of drugs, such as heroin, uh, follows directly from his libertarian principles. If you give everyone the choice, most people will choose responsibly. Those who don't choose responsibly will have to accept the consequences of their actions. Either way, people should have the choice, and the government should not get involved like a parent trying to protect her children. As Ron Paul puts it in his, his freedom principles, uh, which can be found on his website, the lives and actions of people are their own responsibility, not the government's. Ron Paul's position on same-sex marriage can also be traced back to this libertarian principle. Uh, he argues that the government should stay out of the marriage business altogether, and that private, voluntary associations should be allowed to marry whomever they like and call it whatever they like. What business does the government have telling me who I can and can't marry? Once again, freedom in this case means keeping government out of our lives and being able to make uh, decisions for ourselves and take responsibility for our own actions. Another feature of libertarianism that I'd like to highlight is that liberty is understood in terms of property and self-ownership. Of course, you just gave a talk on, on Locke, I believe, too. So this is taken uh, directly from John Locke's conception of... Uh, I, I didn't catch of, that of, last part. Uh, sorry. No, that they said to Heron. Oh, Heron just did a presentation on John Locke. Oh, okay. Who, uh, and, and this conception of uh, uh, freedom in terms of property is it comes more or less from John Locke. Um, so, uh, basically, I own myself just as I own material things, and I can do whatever I like with my property, including exchange it on the open market. Why should I not be allowed to sell myself into slavery, for example, to pay for my children's education or to pay off my college debt? If the government were to prevent, prevent me from doing so for my own good, uh, would it not be acting paternalistically? So this is the libertarian position. Uh, oh. Not all libertarians necessarily believe that you should be able to sell yourself into slavery, but a lot of them do. Um, I should make that. When you say the libertarian position, I, I wonder, and I hope it's okay to ask. Whether I'm generalizing a bit. Right, like, I wonder who you have in mind as, uh, I, I think right. of Jan Narvison, I think of Robert Nozick. Right, so uh, Robert Nozick is my main source. I've actually, um, I've, I've actually talked to Jan Narvison before in the past, and, you know, um, but uh, yeah, so both, uh, and uh, basically both uh, Nozick and Narvison uh, look at uh, freedom as basically being property. So right. The idea that we own ourselves. Um, and so I think both, um, are a little bit reluctant to say we should be able to sell ourselves into slavery, but both at least entertain that, that idea sure. that we should be able to do that. So, um, okay, but another example, which is you know slightly less controversial, I think, for, for a lot of libertarians. Um, what if I wanted to sell one of my kidneys? Why should I not be allowed to sell something that I own? As Robert Nozick, um, a libertarian philosopher, explains, the central core of the notion of a property right in X is the right to determine what should be done uh, with X. If I have a property right in myself, as libertarians believe, then do I not have the right to determine what should be, what should be done with my own organs? Uh, so a final example, which I borrow from, from Michael Sandel's book on justice. Uh, in 2001, a strange encounter took place in the German village of Rottenburg. Uh, burned Jürgen Brandis, 43-year-old software engineer responded to an internet ad seeking someone willing to be killed and eaten. 